come into the sanctuary and just to touch base with everyone. Uh, please know if I missed you or I overlooked you, it was not on purpose. I always feel bad. I, I don't want to offend anybody when I'm going around and I'm, I'm trying to touch base with everyone. And sometimes I miss individuals. And it means a lot to me just to be able to connect with my flock every Sunday and just, just touch base with you. I was thinking this is just an awesome time every year, and particularly in school systems as they go off or during tournament action. And uh, what an exciting time. It's tournament action. The Vanderpoops will be going down to Wells Fargo with the big team, and uh, that's an exciting time. I never made it to sports there. I did think about it. It was 40 years ago at this time that I wrestled in high school. And I wrestled 167, uh, and sometimes they pushed me up to 185, and I had to give a lot of weight, and I got hammered at 185 whenever I had to give that much weight. And I remembered it was my last dual meet before we were going into tournament action. It was about this time, maybe a few weeks previous. And I came up against a guy from Muscatine. He was a 3A school at that time. And he would go on to become the state champion at 3A that year. And he took me to the cleaners. He ripped my ligaments, my left knee, and my tournament action my senior year then was done. Uh, any chance I had at that point was over. Uh, and it was a disappointment as a kid uh, facing that, as a young adult facing that. But uh, what an exciting time this time of the year when you have tournament action going on and you have the, you know, sometimes the, the glory of winning and then you have the agony of defeat. When that, when that take, not going to happen this year, right? <laughs> You're going all the way. <laughs> cool. Cool. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention. Uh, by the way, if your young person has an accomplishment in school, please let Adam and I know. We, we want to rejoice with you. That's what the Bible says, to rejoice with those who rejoice. And it's not on spiritual things, and not always on spiritual things, it's just life things. We want to be able to rejoice with you as we do with uh, John and Michelle uh, getting engaged. We want to rejoice. Uh, her son, Dalton, had her, got on the dean's list over at NIAC, so we rejoice with him. That's pretty cool. This is my Bible. Its words bring life to me. By following it, I will be what God wants me to be. Lord, we open this word, open our hearts now to receive it. I think of what Psalm 119 says, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Open our eyes, we pray, in our hearts. Amen. For the last two weeks, we've been in a series about heaven entitled, Knowing Where You Are Going. Our focus in those messages have been on what you need to know about getting into heaven, the last two. I'm going to change direction a little bit with this series. I need to share with you today four common beliefs, and I've shared this before, but I need to lay some groundwork, and then we're going to talk about some other things before I close. Four common beliefs about the afterlife that are very prevalent in that some of the people who are your fellow workers, your neighbors, your friends, and even family members believe, yet these are not the truth. Very prevalent, but you need to understand these four common beliefs, they are not the truth when it comes to heaven. The first one is purgatory. How many have come out of the Catholic Church or you were raised as a Catholic? Raise your hand. Okay, uh, there's a lot of good things within the Catholic Church, but this is one of those things that's not a biblical concept, uh, not a biblical belief. Purgatory, those of you who are raised in Catholicism, you know all about this, probably even more than I know about it. Uh, you believe that for a, a long time. Purgatory is believed to be a place where most go after death and before going to heaven where they are purified of any sins. Ray, you can probably turn me down because I am probably going to get a little more excited here. It's a place, believed, where most go after death before going to heaven where they are purified of any sin still left in them, and then they're made ready to live in the perfect state of heaven. That's basically purgatory. And their basis for such a belief is found in one of the books of the Catholic Bible. It's not found in our Bible. If you've ever picked up a Catholic Bible, they're going to have several books that's not in our Bible. It's called the Apocrypha. <coughs> and in 2 Maccabees chapter 12, their Bible speaks about that. That's a, one of the books of their Bible uh, about purgatory. They also teach that purgatory is mentioned 
but it's a stretch. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 to 15, that speaks about all our works that we built on Jesus, they're going to go through the fire. And Catholics will say that's a text that proves purgatory. But when one looks at that passage, he can easily see that it has to do with the loss of one's rewards for after he gets into heaven, based on how he's invested his life, based on how he's built on the foundation of Jesus, it's not about being purified before he can get into heaven. So that's pulling out of context, clearly, in what that passage is speaking. Now, how Catholics can get any peace holding on to such a doctrine is beyond me for a couple reasons. And let me just probe here. When you talk to a Catholic that's really died in the world Catholic and they, they know their doctrine, none of them can tell you how long a person is going to be in purgatory. Some believe a person will be in purgatory up to 1,000 to 2,000 years. Now stop and think about the implications of that. Even many of the Catholic theologians will tell you that the only difference between the fire of hell and the fire of purgatory is one of duration, not of degree. So what peace can purgatory possibly give a family that's lost a loved one? Because Catholics believe most people go to purgatory. There are a few godly people, such as Ethel McLaughlin, who will probably pass purgatory. <laughs> She'll go immediately to heaven. But if you're a guy like A.J. Applenau, you're sunk. You know, you're good. <laughs> Some people will pass it, but most people have to go to purgatory. Catholics believe this. Now stop and think about that. And it shows you people really don't ponder what they believe. What peace could I possibly have when my loved one has died and now I know that they're in purgatory? That's what my belief tells me. They're in purgatory. And by the way, Catholic theologians, many of them, and it's even found in their theological books, they will tell you that the fires of hell, there's no difference between the fires of hell and the fires of purgatory. It's just one of duration. Eventually, you get out of the fire of purgatory. What possible peace could that give any family to think, even though their loved one will finally get to heaven, but they're now suffering in the fires of purgatory? Stop thinking about that. Most people don't really ponder and, and delve deep into what they believe. I remember one conversation I had with a Catholic uh, sister of mine. I believe she loves Jesus, but she is so Catholic. <laughs> she had a loved one pass away. And I, I asked her. I had the open conversation. This was many years after we had known her. I said, is, is he out of purgatory now? Oh, yes. I said, how do you know that? Well, I just sensed that. Now, I didn't want to push back, and I didn't want to hurt her feelings. I thought, just since then, <coughs> this is an issue. No one can tell you how long a person's got to be in purgatory. And so, Catholics, as some of you know, you've paid for having a mass said to get your loved one out of purgatory. Maybe you've given money to get your loved ones out of purgatory. But they can never tell you if that, your loved one is out. They might say, well, I sensed it. But they can never tell you that they're out. Again, the question I have, what kind of comfort does that give someone before they die? Think about that. Adam, he's on your you're on your deathbed. I come in, well, Adam, you're going to have to go through purgatory. We don't know how long the fires of hell are going to last there in purgatory. But, hey, brother, someday you're going to get out of that. Stop and think about that. And that's basically, that's what Catholics believe. You go to purgatory. It's not a good place. Amen. Now, the only thing good about it in their mind is you get out of it. Hell, you never get out. But here's the deal, folks. It's not a biblical teaching. One other thought, and then some scripture. Someone who has suffered physically for a long time, their loved ones will often say they're now out of pain. If you're a Catholic, you can't say that. Y'all with me? Because more likely, your loved one, according to Catholic belief, they're in purgatory, and they're not out of pain. Just a thought. In contrast to this belief, this is what the Bible says. Okay? We've got a lot of beliefs out there, purgatory being one of them. This is what the Bible says. Take and turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 
in the King James Bible, it says to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. There's no gap. When I leave this earth, I have the hope. I have the biblical teaching. It's not some pie in the sky hope, but it's hope grounded in truth that the once my heart stops, I'm instantly in the presence of God. I'm not having to go through a, a process of being purged. The blood of Jesus purges me, cleanses me. And I don't need a place called purgatory to get that. Another passage of scripture, Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Look at verse 21 and then also 23. Paul says in verse 21, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He knew when he passed from this life to the next, he was going to be in the presence of Jesus. It was gain. There was not going to be any more suffering. Amen. And then verse 23, Paul says, I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. Paul knew there was no stages of purgatory that he was going to have to go through. When he left this earth, he was going to be instantly with the Lord. That's the hope we have based on the scriptures. Y'all with me this morning? Yeah. And we need to base what we believe, but this is a belief that's out there today, and many hold to it, but it's not biblical. As Christians who've committed to follow Jesus, we have the confidence based on not what we sense, but on what we know. That once we pass from this life to the next, we are with Jesus. If we've been in a committed relationship with him. So stop being worried about what happens after death if you've committed your life to Jesus. You're going to find out in this series that once you pass from this life to the next, you will not want to come back. One of the video clips in our grief share course that we have talks about a guy that uh, uh, his pastor walked up to him and he was grieving the loss of his wife. And he, and this pastor told this guy, they were golfing together, and the pastor told this guy, he says, I know that you miss her, and I know that it's terrible going through this life. But you know what? I don't think she's missing you. You think about that. When your loved one gets to heaven, you need to understand, and we're going to study about heaven, they're not going to want to come back. They're not going to want to come back. I often wonder what Lazarus thought when Jesus raised him from the dead. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Think about it. Because we're going to find out heaven is a place that you're not going to want to leave. That's the point. Second real common belief. It's not true. It's a real common belief. It's called universalism. Universalism. It basically teaches that everyone eventually makes it to heaven. In other words, all go to heaven. This, too, is a commonly held belief. In fact, I challenge you, just think about the funerals you've been to where the person who died is no longer, of course, with us. And we've gone to the funeral, and we know that they've lived like the devil, but they made them out to be in heaven. There's more universalistic people out there, even in the church. Universalism. It believes that all go to eventually to heaven. Scripture is clear. I've already shared these verses. Not all go to heaven. In fact, few go to heaven. Matthew chapter 7, if you'll turn there. Again, I just want to challenge you when you come to this church, you need to know we're not going to think about what theology tells us. We're going to think about what the Word of God tells us. Amen. That's what we're going to present. And this is what the Word of God says. In fact, I challenge you. That's why we give you the notes. You can take it home. Last week we did it. We went around and we looked at what your Bible said. And you're going to find out this is what your Bible says too. Matthew chapter 7, look at verses 13 and 14. It says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. That's what the Bible says. Only a few find it. Find what? Find heaven. And then Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. It's sobering. We don't like to think this way, but we need to think and believe what the Bible says, the truth. 
Luke 13, verses 23 and 24. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and not be able to. So just like purgatory, universalism is not a scriptural, biblical teaching. And what's scary, there are churches all over North Iowa that basically teach that. And it's not true. There are Christians all over that basically believe that. But it's not true. Third thing that's real prevalent, particularly, uh, Pastor Terry knows this, he's been to India. And they hold to this doctrine, big time. Reincarnation. Reincarnation, also known as rebirth or transmigration, is the belief that the non-physical part of a living being begins a new life in a different physical form or body after biological death. In other words, right now, here I am, my soul's in this body. But when I die, this body, this physical part of me, it goes into the grave, and my soul and spirit then goes into another body. Now, it may be a human body, it may be an elephant, it may be a cow, but that's why in India they revere animals so much, because you don't know that could be one of your loved ones that's inhabiting that elephant. True story that happened to our open Bible mission station in India. John Paul is the director there. He's over about 370 some churches. And they have a fenced in area. They were growing some vegetables and stuff and they put an electric fence around it. True story. In fact, we prayed for him here because he was in big time trouble. They put an electric fence about it, around it and an elephant got caught in the fence and he killed it. Killed that elephant. People were Hot. Inflamed. They took him to court. And he was going to have to spend time in jail simply because an elephant came up against the electric fence. It was their property. But he killed that elephant. Why did they hold to that? Because they are entrenched with that doctrine of reincarnation. Now, praise God, we prayed for him and, and God answered and he got out of that predicament. But it was a tough deal. If you go to India, you know that. Uh, Indian religions that hold to that, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, and most varieties of paganism have some form of reincarnation. Uh, this belief, by the way, is very prevalent within the New Age movement, uh, particularly among some of the elite of Hollywood. Isn't it something when you're a famous person, you automatically become a spokesperson? You don't have to have a brain, but you can just be a spokesperson. <laughs> Again, like the previous two beliefs, it's not biblical. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, just as man is destined to die once, and after that to face judgment. It's not, I go into another body, I live that, die, go into another body. No, you die once, and then you face the Lord. The last common belief that's out there that's not biblical is known as annihilationism. It's also known as extinctionism or destructionism. It's the belief that those who are wicked will perish or cease to exist. Imagine it this way. Some of you men have done it. Now, ladies, when you set up for a picnic and you have some ants on the picnic table, you ever notice how the ladies are trying to just sweep the ants off the picnic table. But if you've got a man there, you know what he does? He squashes the bug. Men have done this. Some of you, I've done it. Many of you have done the same thing. You've seen an ant on a table and you just take it, whoop, and you just kind of smear it. You know what I'm talking about? That's the thought. When you're annihilated, God just, whoop, and you're done. No more soul, no more body, no more spirit. You're just, whoop, it's over. Okay? You're not in any pain. You don't know that, but you cease to exist. Body, soul, spirit. That's what it means to be annihilated. And many evangelicals are caving in this area and believing this because they do not want to believe the biblical doctrine of hell and that hell is just as eternal as heaven is. And so they've come up with this belief. In fact, those of you that are into Bible study books and stuff, there was a guy that caved in this area. He was a conservative evangelical scholar. His name was John Stott. He came out in the 80s. And bought into this. And when he fell in this area, many followed suit. And it's amazing the amount of pastors that believe that today. Because they cannot comprehend the fact 
that hell is forever. And so they've come up with this false doctrine. I want to read, by the way, I believe every Christian certainly needs to have a Bible in this library and he needs to read it. But two books that I'll be in the, a library of every Christian. Number one is this uh, book on heaven by Randy Alcorn. In my mind, this is the best, and I have read several. Alcorn does a knockout job talking about heaven. And then the other one is a book on hell by Bill Weiss. It's, both of these are theological books, but they're written in a way the average guy can understand it. If I can understand it, you can understand it. And so uh, I would encourage you to pick up a copy of both of them. I want to read from Bill Weiss's book on hell about annihilationism. He says, there's a growing number of Christians who believe in annihilationism. This teaching has come about because many people cannot accept the fact that God would allow a person to suffer in hell for all eternity. However, eternal punishment is taught by Jesus, Paul, and the apostles all throughout the New Testament. <coughs> Again, as the previous three, this view is not a biblical view. Take your Bibles and go to Matthew chapter 25. Look at verse 36. Matthew 25, look at verse 46, excuse me, verse 46. It says, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Notice, and I emphasize eternal. It's not something that you get out of. And then Mark's gospel, chapter 9, verses 42 to 40. I could have given you many. I'm just giving you a couple here. By the way, again, I would encourage you to get Weiss's book and Alcorn's book for more scriptures. And if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. Where their worm does not die. I catch this next phrase. And the fire is not quenched. Now we may not like the concept of hell. In fact, if there's any doctrine that is up to me, I would remove, that would be it. But I can't remove it. You know why? Because God put it here. It's the truth. You may not like it. It may blow your mind. But hell is eternal. And there are going to be all kinds of people that will spend eternity in hell if we don't get the gospel message to them. Let me read another passage from Weiss's book. He says on page 259, If someone believes in annihilationism, they would then dismiss the eternal suffering of hell, which would lessen the fear of the Lord in the final judgment. After all, what's the big concern if you simply cease to exist? I would like to hear the answer, and this is a good argument. I would like to hear the answer of the annihilationist as to why they think Jesus died. What did Jesus save us from if there is no hell to suffer? Scripture is clear. The Bible says Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. My Bible says. Why did he go through all that pain and suffering if those who reject him don't exist after death? When John the Baptist, then he quotes from R.T. Kendall in his book, when John the Baptist warned people to flee from the wrath, arguably the first message of the New Testament, and eternal punishment was exactly what he meant, his warning made sense. I doubt people would run from coming wrath with much concern if they knew in advance it meant only annihilation. Let that sink in. There's not a lot to be said about that doctrine other than we've come up with it because we don't want to face the true doctrine that hell is eternal. Before I move on, let me summarize the above four. Man has come up with these false beliefs due to not wanting to hold what the Bible teaches. They do not like what the Bible has to say and the implications that a biblical belief has upon them. So they try and make something that the Bible says, turn it around and make it into something it does not say. Or they try to change it. This is a broken record. You hear it week in, week out from this pulpit. You're going to continue to hear it. 
The B-I-B-L-E is the word of God. This is the truth. And we need to believe what this book says and not what the world tells us. This is what it says. Hold to what the word says, not what the world says. And I've got to tell you, these four beliefs are very common when you begin to deal with people and what they truly believe. Let me share three other thoughts and then I'll close this morning. Three other, three other thoughts concerning heaven. The first is this. We need, as God's people, to refuse to stay ignorant about heaven. And this is what I found, particularly when we lost our daughter now, more about that in a second, is that I didn't know a whole lot about heaven. I've been preaching for years for people to give their life to Jesus and commit to follow him so they could get to heaven, but I couldn't tell them much what heaven was about. And most Christians are that way. And they're purposefully ignorant, willfully ignorant. Perhaps more than any other study of topics of the Bible, with the exception of a study on hell, a study of heaven often gets pushed back by well-meaning people, and they do so by using four main passages of Scripture to maintain their ignorance. Christians like to uh, be ignorant because that's the lazy approach. But this is what the Bible says. And they'll use these four passages, but let me just deal with them. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things real belong to us and to our children, that we may follow all the words of this law. So people say, you know what, Pastor? The Bible says the secret things belong to the Lord. Heaven is one of those secret things. We can't know about it, so that's good enough for me. But that's just the book of Deuteronomy, and that's just one passage of Scripture, and that's not what that's referring to. More about that in a moment. There are secret things that God does not want us to to share or he does not want to reveal. But heaven is not one of them. Let me go on. Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9 speaks about, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. And Christians that want to give an excuse for their ignorance about heaven will often say, That's a heavenly thought. That's a God thought. I can't know that thought. And so they're discontent with being ignorant about seeking in their Bibles what the Bible really says. Another passage of Scripture, and this is the classic. I promise, if you read about heaven, you're going to come across this passage of Scripture. Christians use it all the time. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. However, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived, but God has prepared for those who love it. And then they stop there. They put a period there. But you need to read on to the next verse. The next verse begins with a but. The next verse, verse 10, says this. But God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. Yeah, your mind can't conceive it, but God, by His Spirit, can reveal things to you about heaven. How does the Spirit do it? Through His Word, because the Spirit wrote the Word of God. And so people use that verse. They misquote. That's probably one of the most misquoted verses in all of the Word of God. They misquote that verse to maintain their ignorance because they don't want to get in and find out what the Word really says about heaven. Stop making excuses about what you don't know. Study about it. And you'll find out this word has a lot to say where we're going to spend eternal life. Now let me give you, well, more about that in just a second. Yeah. It makes sense if we're going to spend eternity there, we would do some inquiry on what it's going to be like. Remember years ago, Adam and my son and I, we went to Wyoming on an antelope hunt. It was the hunt of a life. Had all kinds of tags. Each of us had about five tags in our pocket. Back then you could get that many. And we were going to harvest antelope. We were having a ball. We thought we had heard the truth about what the laws were. <laughs> you see where this conversation is going? A buddy of mine said, told us what was a legal shot. You had to be so far off the road. We took that to be the truth. <coughs> you see where this is going? <laughs> we see a couple of antelope out there. It's time for Adam to shoot. I was on the binoculars. My son's videotaping. I mean, we're professional hunters. <laughs> now, we knew in Iowa that you can't shoot across the public water. But we're not in Iowa, we're in the state of Wyoming, and we weren't shooting across water. There was this little sliver of private land 
but these antelopes were on public cutting. My buddy had said, all you got to be is on the other side of the greater rut. And so we thought, well, that just means the ditch. He could get in the ditch. The gun will shoot across that little, it's just a little sliver. He shoots across and he drops two antelope. Yeah! I mean, it was a man moment. <laughs> Here comes the DNR. I said, I'm going to stay at the truck. We already had one. I was going to clean the one we already had. And they go across. As I'm cleaning up, I see a pickup pull up behind us. And I see on the side of the truck, Wyoming game and fish. <laughs> I'm thinking, this is not good. <laughs> Long story short, that cost your associate pastor over $400. It's funny what men do when they're in trouble, you know. <laughs> men laugh. I don't know if you know this, women. It, it irritates women, but men just, they get kind of a humorous laugh when they say something like that. And so, it ended up costing me, he got fined 400 and some dollars. Now, you need to know, I did help him out part with that. I gave him some money toward that, uh, that fine. Because I did take some responsibility for that. Here's the point. My wife and I would go the next year. We knew we were going out to that state. We were going to be in that state, and we were going to be underneath the laws of that state. We were going to be there for a time period. So you know what I did? I ordered the book of laws from what It was a red book. It was about this thick. And I read through that book. Why? Because I was going to spend time there. I wanted to make sure I knew the rules and what was all involved, where we should have probably done that the first time. <laughs> now, I did that. For a hunt that I was only going to be on the next year for four or five days, my wife and I were there. I was going to be there. But do you see how foolish maybe it is or unwise it is? We're going to spend eternity in heaven for eternity. <laughs> Why wouldn't we want to study about where we're going to spend that much time? It makes sense. But we, instead, we give excuses, and we've used those four verses. Christians use them all the time. Oh, Pastor, you can't know about it. That's not true. This book, and you're going to see it in the upcoming weeks, it has a lot to say. And some of you are going to be blown away by what this book has to say about heaven. Let me ask you before I move on an application. For those of you who have lost loved ones, have you ever wondered what they're doing right now? Mm -hmm. Tom, I thought of you. Have you ever wondered what your dad's doing right now? Gary? What's Terry doing? Dancing. Dancing? Terry? What'd you get? He's been there. He's served the Lord. He's there. Ever think about that, Peggy? Your dad, Ralph, just passed away. What's, what's he doing? I think of Pete McLaughlin. Way to go. Lauren, I think of your wife. You ever think about what's she doing? Danny, your mom? It's a good question. We believe that she's in heaven. We believe our loved ones are there. What are they doing? I think of Mark's. I was there the night that Mark's dad died. You see your dad. That wasn't Roger. He was gone. <laughs> Isn't that what he's doing? Or your grandma, Vicki, passed away? I think it's a good question. We say we believe in heaven. Do we really? And if we do believe in it, they're doing something. When we lost our daughter now, I was enamored. She was at a place that I can only preach about right now. And I wanted to know what she was doing. And that forced me into this study on heaven. Stop. Being ignorant about heaven. But do what the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 15, where it says, Study to show thyself approving. This book has a lot to say. We're going to begin to get into it in the upcoming weeks about what heaven is all about. It's exciting. And, and, and we're going to deal with some more false beliefs about heaven. Secondly, knowing where you are going is based on the word, not on your performance. 
Knowing where you are going is based on the word, not on your performance. You know what shakes a person's belief about going to heaven? Their performance. Let me illustrate it this way. Let's just say you've had a bad week. And let's just say you've messed up several times. It's been a bad week. Let's just say that when you came to church, it was one more thing that you messed up on. Let's just say, man, you got in a fight with your wife. How many got in a fight? No, I won't. <laughs> you got in a fight with your wife. It happens all the time. The devil loves to get in the cars of Christians on their way to church. He has a heyday. And you get in a fight with your wife, or you get in a fight with the kids. You're doing one of these, calm down, you're driving the car. And you're trying to... I'm not the only dad that's done that. And then someone pulls out in front of you, and you've been working on, you've been trying to rid yourself of that bad BC problem before Christ problem of profanity. And it's amazing that all the idiots that are out there on Sunday morning driving on your way to church. <laughs> and one of those idiots pulls out in front of you, and a few of those words slip out. And your wife <laughs> slaps you. And then your kids back her up. Dad! <laughs> <laughs> and then you walk into church, and the pastor asks you, hey, oh, I'm good, fine. <laughs> sure you are. Yeah, yeah. You can ask for forgiveness, and you need to do that. And God forgives, and you can ask, honey, I'm sorry. Kids, I blew it. By the way, dads, you get this for free this morning. If you want to be an awesome dad, your kids will think you're awesome. If you're man enough, when you blow it, you go to their room at night and you apologize. You say, dad blew it. One of the reasons my kids respected me and loved me as a dad is they knew when their dad blew it, and he blew it often, he was mad enough to go back to the room and say, I'm sorry. And fess up. You can be forgiven. Your wife can forgive you. God will forgive you. Your kids will forgive you. But you come into church, and you have this in your spirit that you just failed. What is that? It's performance. You feel so guilty. That when I give the altar call to get saved, you've got to say, stand and get saved again. You don't have to get saved again, but you, that's how guilty you feel. And so you stand. Why do you do that? Because you're basing your confidence not on what the Word says about forgiveness. You're basing your confidence on performance, your performance. People do this all the time. If they've had a bad week, then they can have a uh, terrible time to worship. But if they have a good week... Worship will be awesome. Why? Because they have. We don't, we don't want to admit this, but we think it really impresses God when we have a good week and we don't sin. And so that's why we feel, oh, man, we can go in and we can worship because I haven't sinned this week. You know what? You can worship even if you have sinned this week. In fact, folks, listen to this. You're not any more forgiven and accepted. 30 years as you've lived for the Lord as you were the first day you confessed that sin. Yeah. Same blood covers you. Yeah. But what goes on? Knowing where we are going is based on the word and not your performance. And I, I, I'm going to give you an illustration here in just, just a moment that deals with this. But many of us, we, we approach God and our confidence level is based on our performance. Our confidence level needs to be on what this word says. Because your performance is never going to live up. Take your Bibles and go to 1 John chapter 5. Look at verse 13. Again, this all goes back to the word. I, I want our church to be word people. People that base what they believe in the B-I-B-L-E. Not their feeling, not their experience, not what someone else is saying, but the Word of God. This is what the Word of God says. 1 John 5, verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. These were Christian people, okay, that John was writing to. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Why is he writing them? So that you may know that you have eternal life. I believe these people were struggling with assurance of their salvation. Just like people struggle today. 
So John says, I write these things to you. Why? So that you may know. God wants you to know where you're going. Well, honey, you agreed with me. I said, God wants you to know where you're going. This is a thing that Christian, as a pastor, I know Pastor Jerry, you, you dealt with this when you pastored. It's one of the biggest things people struggle with is being assured of their salvation. And they let the devil beat the tar out of them every week. Again, knowing where I'm going is based on what this word says, not on my performance. So that means if I've had a bad week and I've been trying to serve God, but I've been failing, and I keep going back to him to ask him to forgive me, he forgives me. I'm accepted. I can worship him. But the problem is many times we let our performance determine that. The third thing is this. Heaven is worth whatever God asks of you. I've used this illustration many times. It's just such an awesome illustration. There was a guy by the name of Jim Elliott. He was a missionary to Ecuador back in the mid-50s. He had a call to minister to a tribe there in Ecuador that was very militant. Uh, they were known, they'd just kill you. And him and his friends, there were four others. You know the story. You've seen the movie out. They died on a sandbar in a river. They landed their plane on this sandbar. And as the story goes, they had a gun there in the plane. They could, have, they could have used it. They chose not to, and they died. Filled full of arrows and spears. They found some of their bodies, some of them didn't find, floating in the river. He made a comment in his diary. He wrote, I memorized it years ago, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep. To gain what he cannot lose. What an awesome statement. Now, what most people don't understand, this wasn't an old guy. He had wisdom far beyond his years. He was 28 years old. He died on January 8, 1956. Heaven is worth whatever God asks. Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Look at verse 36. Mark chapter 8, verse 36 says this. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. I'll tell you what, if anyone has gone through hell on earth, it was Paul. They beat him, stoned him, shipwrecked. And yet, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory. That's how great heaven is going to be. So truly, whatever God asks of you, I can promise you this. It will be worth it. When he speaks to you, my encouragement, be obedient. Years ago, we went to Pensacola, Florida. There was a revival going on at an Assembly of God church. That section of town was called Brownsville. And my wife and I, we went down. Some of our people in our church uh, went with us on a bus with Spirit Lake Open Bible. And you would stand in line all day. We did it to go to church. Kids, you not, it was revival. I'd never seen anything like it in my life. We got in line at 9 o'clock in the morning for the 7 o'clock service. Oh, my wife had that up there. By the way, Steve Hill has died. He was the evangelist preaching that died of cancer here uh, a while back. We stand in line at 9 o'clock in the morning. And we met some friends. The day just went fast. I, I, I can't even describe it. You think, you, are you crazy? Man, that was great. <coughs> it was kind of like, uh, you know, being in the parking lot of a football game, having your, your party out there. And we just stood in line and it was... We had a great time, made some friends there, made some friends with a Jew, a born-again Jew that was there. Uh, one of the days we were down there, we decided we were going to stand in line, because we, we wanted good seats, okay? I, I, if you go with Pastor Will to a conference or something, you're not going to find me in the back. 
I'm going to be just where I'm here. I want in the anointed, the spit section. So when that preacher is preaching, I want it, baby. And so we're going to try to get down front. So we, we got there in the line. We, we wanted to be, have good seats. Well, the one day we decided to do a little sightseeing. And so we went, Peggy, did you go on that trip? Yeah, Peggy was there. And uh, uh, we decided to do a little sightseeing. And so uh, we thought, we'll just get there late. And so we had to go up and we had to sit in the balcony that night. Remember that? Had to sit in the balcony. Well, when, when I went in, they had badges. And they wanted to know who you are. And, are you a pastor? Yeah. And they put a pastor badge on. see where this is going? I go to the top of the balcony and we're way up and when this Steve Hill was preaching, I, I tell you what, the conviction of God, people literally ran to the altar. They ran to the altar. We're up on the top floor. Remember, I have the pastor's badge on. That means I should be pretty close to God, right? You see where this is going? He's preaching, and, and the conviction of God falls. The Spirit of God says to my heart, get down to that altar. You've got issues in your heart. Now, I was good with going to the altar, but you know what I wanted to do? wanted to pull the pastor's badge off. It was going to be embarrassing that the pastor had to get saved again. <laughs> God says, you leave that on. And so I did. It was a very humbling experience. But I cared more about getting right with God than I did about my pride and my good position. I shared that story. Heaven is worth whatever God asks you. And I'm not talking so much about material things. God asks you to do something. God convicts you of your sin. Do it now. Confess it now. Don't wait. Now, I was born again, but the conviction of God was on me that day, just like you. I had to go, and I had to get that other junk. Out of my house. It didn't matter all the people in my church that were there. I didn't care at that point. I only cared about one thing. I wanted to get right with Jesus. I wanted to make sure everything within my power <coughs> that the account was cleared. Heaven is worth whatever God asks you to do. So I want to tell you what, when God begins to prick your heart, and your heart begins to beat real hard. And I give an altar call. And God's saying you need to stand. Or you need to go forward. You need to ask for forgiveness. Do it now. Do it now. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 2 says. In the time of my favor I heard you. And in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Do it now. Don't wait. I was watching a video clip. I didn't even tell my wife it was yesterday. When Steve Hill gave an altar call, he preached down there week in, week out. They had revival service every night for I don't know how many years. And I began to weep in my office yesterday. Jesus, I want more of you. What I have is not enough. I need more. Heaven is worth whatever God asks you to do. Don't ever doubt that. He won't be a debtor to you. It's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it all to surrender our lives totally, 100% to him. I promise you, you won't regret it when you get to the other side. You're going to say, I'm so glad I listened to what Pastor Will said. I promise you. It's worth it.